In this video, we're going to be covering the cervical flexion rotation test. But before we get into the test procedure, let's review a little bit of basic anatomy and Freyette's third law. So right here we see all the bones of the cervical spine. We have the occiput up top, C1 the atlas, C2 the axis, and then C3 down through C7. Now when we look at the joint between the occiput and the atlas, or C1, this would be the atlanto-occipital, or OA, joint. If we look at the joint between the atlas, C1, and the axis, C2, this is the atlanto-axial, or AA, joint. These two joints comprise the upper cervical spine. And then if we look at the joints involving cervical vertebrae below C2, these would all be joints of the lower cervical spine. So for example, the joints between C2 and C3, between C3 and C4, all the way down to between C6 and C7. These would be joints of the lower cervical spine. And if we look at every one of these joints, they all have a certain range of motion that they allow for each movement. Specifically, we're interested in rotation here. So if we look at the atlanto-occipital joint, it doesn't permit any rotation. If we look at the atlanto-axial joint, it permits between 35 and 40 degrees of rotation. And then if we look at all of these lower cervical spine joints combined, these collectively allow 30 to 35 degrees of rotation. So let's suppose we wanted to specifically look at the amount of atlanto-axial rotation. Well, we can't just do the normal goniometric measurement for cervical rotation because we'd be getting a combination of rotation permitted by the AA joint and rotation permitted by the lower cervical spine. So if only there was some way to eliminate the contribution by the lower cervical spine, then we could solely look at the rotation provided by the atlanto-axial joint. And that's where Freyette's third law comes into play. So the bottom line here is that if we maximally flex the cervical spine, we're going to sharply reduce the contribution to rotation by the lower cervical spine. If we reduce the contribution by the lower cervical spine, we'll be looking solely at the rotation provided by the atlanto-axial joint. And this is described by Friette's third law. Now, Friette did not actually come up with this particular law. He came up with his first two. This was actually uh, created by a DO, C.R. Nelson, in 1948. And basically what he said is that when motion is introduced in one plane, it will modify, or in other words, reduce motion in the other two planes. The third principle sums up the other two laws by stating dysfunction in one plane will negatively affect all other planes of motion. Really the part of this we care about is the first sentence. When motion is introduced in one plane, it will reduce motion in the other two planes. So flexion occurs in the sagittal plane. So if we maximally flex the cervical spine, then we're going to reduce motion in the coronal plane, which we don't care about and we're going to reduce motion in the transverse plane, which we do care about. That's rotation. So look here at the amount of flexion provided by the atlanto-axial joint relative to the amount of rotation. 5 degrees versus 35 to 40. There's barely any flexion. So if we maximally flex the cervical spine, we're really not going to affect the amount of rotation by the atlanto-axial joint. However, if we look at the lower cervical spine, 30 to 35 degrees of rotation, but then 35 to 40 degrees of flexion. So if we maximally flex the cervical spine by Friette's third law, we are going to sharply reduce the amount of side bending and sharply reduce the amount of rotation, which is what we care about. So in other words, maximally flexing the lower cervical spine, which is in the sagittal plane, reduces movement in the frontal and transverse plane, specifically that rotation occurring in the transverse plane. So by maximally flexing the lower cervical spine, we're eliminating or at least sharply reducing the contribution of rotation by the lower cervical spine, and we're getting almost entirely atlanto-axial rotation. And you could certainly take a goniometer and measure this, but let's take a look at the test procedure right now. To perform the cervical flexion rotation test, the patient's going to be positioned in supine, and you're going to be holding the patient's head, as you see right here, with index finger contact on C1. Now, if you have trouble with finding C1, find the C2 spinous process and go just superior to that. If you go just superior to that, you shouldn't feel anything. 
There should just be a space with no palpable bone. That's because the posterior tubercle of C1, which is its equivalent of the spinous process, is too deep to palpate. So if you find that space above the C2 spinous process, your index fingers are in the right position. From here, you're going to maximally flex the patient's cervical spine. So bring up all cervical flexion, like you see here. And then you're going to assess cervical rotation in both directions. So right here, you're going to rotate right. That's specifically assessing atlantoaxial rotation to the right. And then go back to neutral and assess rotation left. This is specifically looking at left atlantoaxial rotation. And a positive test is going to be pain provocation in either direction or an obvious left versus right rotational motion restriction. Thank you for all your support. Be sure to check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.